everybody, and welcome to AMC Movie Talk, Movie Talk Movie Fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus a little bit of insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is AMC Movie News Editor-in-Chief, John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the AMC Movie News Headquarters here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also here is writer-director, John Schnepp. Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Monday, right? Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, as a matter of fact, it's freakish and strange that it's Monday. <laughs> also, here's AMC's Christian Harloff. Happy belated, mothers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Monday, which Intriguing. means <laughs> Mother's Mother's Day, which yeah. means the results of another busy weekend at the box office have been released. It's no surprise it's still in the number one spot as Avengers Age of Ultron, racking up another 77.2 million, bringing its worldwide total up to over 875 million. In second place was the Reese Witherspoon and Sofia Vergara comedy Hot Pursuit with 13.3 million. Blake Lively's Age of Adeline brought in another 5.6 million with third place, with Fury 7 bringing in another 5.2 million for the fourth spot. Rounding out the top five was Paul Blart Mall Cop 2, which brought in another 5.1 million. Jot, what stands out to you about these box office results? A couple of things stand out to me, one both positive and negative. Uh, Avengers Age of Ultron, I thought, would be stronger uh, in its second week. Look, you can't expect a movie that makes $191 million on its opening weekend to have a 40% drop because everybody rushed out to see it on that opening weekend. However, I did expect it to still be around 90. I was kind of expecting it to be around 90 uh, and obviously came in below that. But of course, there's a lot of people out there who are painting, pull out their doom and gloom brush and saying, oh my gosh, is this signal the end for Marvel? It's your blah, blah. Keep this in perspective, everybody. At $77.2 million that the Avengers made on its second weekend, that is the highest second weekend in Hollywood <laughs> history for any film not named Avengers. Let me repeat that. Sorry, it, yeah, it is the all-time highest grossing second weekend ever in the history of movies for any film not also named Avengers. More than Avatar, more, more than any other right. film other than the first Avengers. So while we start, there are already people out there who are shock jockeying to talk, talking about and pontificating the, the end of Marvel. Let's keep in mind, in <laughs> one week, it's made 800 and something million dollars worldwide with a bunch of markets still to open in. So it's doing quite well. And honestly, Age of Adeline has surprised me very much. Yeah. I thought that movie looked just terrible. Not okay, I thought it looked terrible. And it was actually quite a bit better than I thought it would be. So not, I'm quite not a bit better there. than terrible. It's quite a bit better than terrible. I'm not gonna say it was a great movie, but I also per thought it would make like $12 million, to be honest. I, I didn't see the appeal. It's already made like 31, so that's pretty good for it. So those things that stand out to me. Schnapp, what about you? Yeah, it's funny that there's two movies both with the age of, you know, playing, <laughs> and they're both like I one. I didn't put that together, one, actually. One, two, and three. Yeah, there's like one off from each other. The age of, you know. Uh, I wish there age was a third one. Age of Paul Blart. Yeah, age of Mall Cop, you know. <laughs> maybe it would have been higher than five. Yeah, the one to me that stands out is Hot Pursuit. Like, I literally hadn't heard of it. We were just talking about this earlier. Like, didn't even hear of it until like two weeks ago. And then ads popped up everywhere, and then there's a commercial for it, and now it's playing. So... You know, and I I, uh, I haven't seen it. I don't know if I'm going to see it. I know Christian saw it. And, uh, didn't you love it? Hot Pursuit. Hot Pursuit? Yeah. Probably my favorite of the year. Uh, <laughs> uh, for me, I think that you, one of the things with Age of Adeline is people are probably going to buy tickets. Yeah, I'll have one for Age of Ultron. Like, Wait a minute. Ultron looks strange. <laughs> no, I'm good. Maybe that added to the money. No, but Age of Adeline, absolutely, to make, is surprising how much money it's making and that it's number three. Um, and it, like John said, it's not. It's, it's certainly not the best movie in the world, but it, it's a... It's a fine for what it is and it's proven that people are enjoying it hot pursuit and we kind of had this conversation off the air i happen to think 13 million is not a great number for this movie because of what reese witherspoon just did for w winning an oscar she's a big draw overseas and they might if they get lucky break even on this thing but i think that they've got to be not happy with a 13 million opening i don't care if it's going against avengers or not in regards to avengers age of ultron i I'm surprised all the conversations that I've had with people going, oh, it didn't do so well, huh? What are you talking about? It's made $300 million. It tied the Dark Knight, I think, as far as fastest to make it to $300 million domestically. It's going to hit a billion 
probably within the next week and a half, a billion dollars in anyone's right mind. How is that a failure? I don't, I don't understand. Maybe because it didn't hit the, the monstrous numbers they were hoping for. But overall, uh, yeah, I would say that to me, honestly, Age Adeline stands out the most. And I'm glad to see Fury is still pulling five million. still pretty good for the amount of money. Oh, like for the amount of weeks, weeks that it's weeks, been yeah. out. And considering that, you know, Avengers Age of Ultron is targeting a lot of the same audience that would be interested in Fury 7 for it to hang around is yeah. great. But yeah, you, you bring up a great point. People got to keep this in mind. Take out the original Avengers. Take that movie away. Just put it on the shelf for just a second. Avengers Age of Ultron. Biggest opening weekend in box office history. Biggest second weekend in box office history. They're doing just fine. So don't, don't worry about them at all. All right, what's next? While promoting his upcoming film Tomorrowland, writer-director Brad Bird revealed a couple of interesting tidbits. First, he confirmed that The Incredibles 2 will be his next film and that he's already written a bunch of pages. He also elaborated on the fact that he's spoken to Lucasfilm president Kathleen Kennedy about the possibility of directing a Star Wars film. On that notion, he stated, I was particularly attracted to the idea of picking up a film in the franchise and J.J. Abrams got very excited about the notion of shaping the next trilogy and then I idea was interesting to me too. But I'm writing the incredible sequel and I can't think too much farther beyond that. I have other things I want to do as well. Schnapp, what do you make of Birds' comments? I love that he's uh, doing The Incredibles 2. We've been talking about this for years. Like, when is The Incredibles 2 going to happen? Oh, I mean, no kidding. So that it's actually happening, that he's actually making it and in charge of it, writing and directing it. Uh, there's no better news than that. So, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly excited to see maybe him take a spin at doing a Star Wars movie you know, in the next couple of years. But to me, that he's doing The Incredibles 2 is just fantastic. Christian? I'm absolutely with you, Schnepp, as far as him doing The Incredibles 2. That's, you want him to do it. You know, that, especially if his heart's in it. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to have him back if, if, if that's indeed the next thing he's working on. Um, as far as Star Wars goes, now we're going to have, it's just, I, I'm still curious to how long the anthology films are going to be just once a year. I'm wondering if because of all the different timelines and everything. Every two can, years. Right, every two years. We're, I mean, we're getting a Star Wars movie every year, but every two years for... But I mean, I, as far as a Star Wars movie in general, we're, we're getting sure. one a year. So I'm wondering how long that's going to be before we start doing two a year because of all the different time periods and stuff we do because then we can... That, that'll, I think, enable us to get someone like a Brad Bird to do an analogy, uh, anthology movie because I'd like to see him do one of those. I think that the anthology movie for me right now, I'd rather see him do than part of the trilogy because like he said, J.J. ultimately shapes it. JJ starts with The Force Awakens. So even Ryan Johnson and whoever follows Ryan Johnson, whether it be JJ coming back or or somebody else, they're following JJ's blueprint here. I'd like to see Brad Bird do something new because with Tomorrowland, you know, without saying anything too much, it, it looks very original. That's great original sci-fi. So to get his spin onto a, a recognized franchise would be something fun. There are so many things I, I love about this. Number one, look, you uh, do AMC Rewind. And on part of that show, you got that, what we call the feeling old segment. We talk about movies turning 20. The Incredibles is over 10 years old. Wow. The Incredibles is over 10 years old. We've been waiting for a sequel to this. Like, look, there are, understandably so, you know, I don't mind sequels. I don't mind reboots, all that kind of stuff. But even people who aren't really big on sequels or reboots, even they know. The Incredibles is a film that was begging to have a follow-up story. Mm -hmm. It was just begging. It was that quality type of film that everybody just got into, set itself up perfectly, that you could pick up a story the next week or pick up a story 10 years down the line or pick up a story whenever you want. It's animated, so it doesn't matter what you want to do. This is a movie that every... If you talk to people the last 10 years, what movie desperately needs a sequel? Seven out of 10 people are going to tell you, The Incredibles. The Incredibles, The Incredibles, The Incredibles. 10 years we've been waiting... Um, I, I think it'll probably be 12 years by the time the movie eventually comes out, maybe 13 years uh, since the original one released. But so it's great that he's returning to that. As far as the idea of Brad Bird visiting the Star Wars universe, after seeing Tomorrowland, well, first of all, I always thought there was some potential there for him, even though I, I, ne I wouldn't have put him in there myself. But there was potential there for him because you look at films like the type of story narrative he can do with The Incredibles, right? He clearly knows how to get into characters. He knows to, how to get an audience attached to characters and use their emotional investment in the characters to his advantage on the big screen to make things really click and work. Then he goes and does that Mission Impossible film. I'm like, okay, we know he can do characters, but now he's coordinating these incredible action sequences and making us as the audience care about these action sequences. And most importantly, he's figuring out a way that a lot of action directors don't know how to do, tie the action directly into the narrative of the film, and everything becomes one pure engine that moves along. 
Now we see Tomorrowland, and everything's embargoed, but I will say this about Tomorrowland. We also see now in Tomorrowland, he's got the imagination. He totally has the imagination for it. And so I would love it if this can happen. No, it's not going to be the second anthology film that uh, uh, that Josh Trank is no longer right. doing. It's probably not going to be episode nine. But remember, Star Wars, is they got plans beyond the next five years. So I think at some point we're going to see him do one. And it's funny because, again, not giving anything away from Tomorrowland, but you can tell just watching Tomorrowland, he's a Star Wars fan. That's you can, can tell. Oh, my God, you're so right. <laughs> Trust, when you see Tomorrowland, you'll know exactly. <laughs> this dude's a Star Wars fan. All right, folks, we've reached out part of the show for a buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Ashley's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? Following the EW cover, the first official images of Quentin Tarantino's The Hateful Eight have been released. Cast members Samuel L. Jackson, Kurt Russell, Jennifer Jason Lee, Bruce Dern, and Tim Roth are featured. The film centers around post-Civil War bounty hunters who try to find shelter during a blizzard, but get involved in a plot of betrayal and deception. Christian, buy us all the first Hateful Eight images. I love them. I definitely buy them. I love them, and I love that... Kurt Russell's playing Wyatt Earp again. Um, <laughs> it, it looks great, man. And I love uh, even uh, 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 Jennifer Jason. No, Jason Shane from The Shield. I forget. Oh, yeah. I forget his name. Um, but it, the, the Quentin Tarantino, because he was so good in, in Django. This helps. All, it, the, all these images look like a sequel to Django, almost too. No, they really do. You don't see they? See a yeah. lot of these these images. And and that's not a bad thing. It's not right. a bad thing at all. <laughs> and from what Quentin Tarantino does, he, re, he reuses a lot of actors that he's comfortable with, which a lot of good directors do anyway. A lot of directors in general do. But it's Tarantino, man. So you're looking, and just that one image of both Jennifer Jason Lee and Kurt Russell screaming at God knows who. I bet you there's some comedy involved in there too, in, in, oh, yeah. in Tarantino fashion. Mm -hmm. So I'm super pumped for these images, and and I still kick myself in the in the butt for uh, for not putting Hateful Eight on my top ten most anticipated because mm -hmm. it, it definitely is. Oh yeah, it's it's got to be on that list. I, I'll be honest with you, I am going to mildly buy. These pictures, the reason I'm going to mildly look, if I hadn't already seen the EW cover, I'd be jumping up and down. But I have seen the cover, and so these follow ups are a nice little addition to it, but nothing that's getting me too much more excited at any rate. I still think you could call this movie Stash, starring uh, Kurt Russell. <laughs> Just call it Stash, and I'm in. That is a legendary yeah, stash. Great that few guys, other than Kurt Russell, could rock that stash that way. So, yeah, for me, it's a buy, Schnepp. Yeah, I, I fully buy this. I love all the images. I can't help but go back to what Dennis was talking about like on Friday where it's like everyone's clothes are crisp and clean. <laughs> yeah. Where's the dirt and grime? But honestly, it doesn't bother me. I was like, but because he said that, I was like looking at Michael Madsen's shirt. I was like, yeah, it looks pretty clean. <laughs> Examining it. Maybe he's a businessman. Yeah, I think there's somebody outside doing the laundry. And that you'll see that before everyone walks into that. You know, a little ca cabin that there's someone washing their clothes. I love that picture of uh, Kurt Russell and Jennifer Jason Lee. Like, it looks like to me like they're singing, and Bruce Dern is all irritated. <laughs> He's like, God, I wish they'd shut up. So it feels like they're in the middle of singing some rousing epic. I cannot wait to see this movie. So I don't even, when have they announced when is it coming out yet? 2015. Yeah. I mean, that's it. I, Rumor I, December at one point. Yeah, it, it was supposed to be, or, or November, November at some December. point. At this point, I'm not, I'm kind of expecting within the next month we're going to hear. Uh, first quarter 2016 release date. I mean, if they can stick to a 2015, that would be great, but starting to get a little bit late in the game. Yeah. All right, what's next? A fresh batch of Terminator Genesis posters have been unveiled, confirming some new details we were unsure of. In addition to the confirmations we already knew, including Arnold Schwarzenegger returning as his infamous T-800, Amelia Clark portraying Sarah Connor and Jai Courtney playing Kyle Reese, we learned that Byung Hun Lee is a T-1000 and that Jason Clark's John Connor is actually a T-3000. John Byers saw these Terminator Genesis character posters and new reveals. Um, I actually like them quite a bit. I'm going to buy them. I'm going to actually say the ones I like the least are the um, the Jai Courtney and the Amelia uh, Clark ones just that I, I don't see much there but at least the Amelia Clark one she's got like the Terminator head in her hand mm -hmm. that that's kind of a mm -hmm. cool thing but the rest of the three of them they made Arnold look cool I, I'm getting flashbacks to T2 with that Byung Hung Lee uh, image. I really do like the design of the like. Say everybody's worried. Why did they spoil that big thing in the trailer? You know what? It may not be a spoiler at all. They may set that up as a part of the story narrative right at the beginning. But whether it is or not, it's a good look, man. It mm -hmm. looks really, really cool. So for me, I'm going to buy them, Christian. 
I'm gonna. It's hard for me to. I'm, I'm gonna. I'll sell it because I only buy Arnold and Gong Lee. Those are the only two I buy. I don't really like the Jason uh, Jason Clark one. I think that it it looks like they're doing too much. It looks like they're trying to do too much. And and Jai Courtney. I don't know what he's doing in that picture. But as far as uh, Sarah Connor, yeah, I, I agree. Holding the Terminator head is kind of cool. But it looks like some really amazing fan art that someone would send us on Twitter. That's really what it looks like. It doesn't. I mean, so and. I don't know. I'm just not. I guess maybe just I'm not excited. And I haven't been excited. This one hasn't been like. Well, wait a minute. It's back to basics here. That's what I think Terminator needs to do. And this movie's not going to do that. Like the first movie was a horror film, and I wanted it to go back to that kind of edge your seat, gritty feel. And this seems glossy and kind of over the top. Uh, I enthusiastically buy it. I feel the opposite of you. Like I mm -hmm. think that this this is going kind of back to basics, not in the horror realm, but they're going back to the original Terminator, taking some of the story seeds from that and then messing with it via time travel. So to me, I'm I'm really excited to see like them just straight up saying, yeah, that's a T-3000. What happened to Doctor Who? Yeah, <laughs> Where is he? Yeah. Like he's supposedly the villain and he just disappeared. Like he was on Entertainment Weekly like eight months ago. Oh, what's the actor's name again? Matt Smith. Matt Smith, yeah. He was supposedly the main villain of this, and now he's disappeared. So to me, I think it's uh, it's a bait and switch. I think they're like, look at the T-3000. Everybody got mad. Like, why are you ruining the movie? I think you're right. I think that little story element's going to come within the first 20 minutes. They're going to be time jumping, and then Matt Smith's going to show up and mess everything up again. So I don't know. I, I'm reading As it. Doctor Who. As Doctor yeah, Who. Doctor as Who. The, that's that's going to be the evil big Doctor Who. Yeah. Right. He's, uh, yeah, the TARDIS like, starts popping up at I different know. time periods. Tom Baker shows up like, what's going <laughs> on? Curry's got yeah, the hat. He's got jelly belly, <laughs> jelly beans. So anyway, yeah, I buy it. I think all the posters look really cool. All right, what's next? Director Brian Singer took to Instagram this weekend to show off an image of James McAvoy going bald and sporting Professor X's signature look for X-Men Apocalypse. The highly anticipated film will hit AMC theaters on May 19th of next year. Schnett buyer sell McAvoy going bald for Apocalypse. I'm buying it, man. He can rock that cue ball. Not a lot of people can do that. You can see that shaved. He's got a clean uh, Professor X look. It's about time. It fits in with Patrick Stewart and as well as the X-Men mythology. Professor X is bald. Here we go. So I'm excited to see that they're actually doing that. The one thing they're going to have to do is explain. Well, a, there's a, in James McAvoy's performance as Professor X up to this point, he's channeled a little bit of Austin Powers. Yeah. Hey, baby. And he's got the, but he's got the shaggy hair. How, I, I don't know what the exact timeline is. I th I'm going to guess it's about maybe 12 years, 13 years. He went from that, hey, full mange of hair to completely bald. But I'm sure this is actually probably going to be a part of the story as well. Uh, I think it looks great. Look, it's a cheap... You know how when a, a band travels to a town, like say they're in, you know, Miami, Florida, and they go for the cheap pop, right? Hello, Miami! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? That's that's the cheap pop. This is a cheap pop for audiences, but it's awesome. Yeah. It's it may be a cheap pop, but the audience is gonna scream, and I got excited seeing it. It's we knew it was coming, but still it's really cool to see that manifestation of it. So I for me it's a buy. Huge buy. I'm so happy to see him. He's Professor X that we know and love, man. And and it's and he's done something with that character with the crazy hairdos over the last two movies mm -hmm. that you've also associated Professor X with us. So they mm -hmm. added that new element. But it's time to get back to the guy we know. And we haven't seen him do that yet. So you're absolutely right. The second it happens, yeah! But, <laughs> but I want to do that. Yeah, I'm ready to do that. Yeah, in the theater. And I think this is great. Can I, I heard... Yeah, oh, I, was, I wanted to add that it's great that he's actually not doing a baldy cap, right. a prosthetic. Oh, yeah. He's actually shaving his head and that's that takes a you know a pair you he's know? that type of actor man yeah, he yeah. really oh, is. Oh, yeah, he, he, he is. is turned into that guy that he's going to be one of those dudes that he, he'll do what uh christian bell did in the machinist and he's the next level type of actor so yeah. i'm not surprised not that shaving your head necessarily puts you in that but he's that guy's yeah sure i'll do it it fits the character is what the character is the weirdest um bit of information that i saw story online uh, this is going back a few weeks ago, and it completely panned out that it was false, and we knew it was fake right away. But there was this little bit of a thing floating around for a bit that Patrick Stewart was involved in this film, and what they were going to do was they were going to pull a Darth Maul, or uh, they were going to pull a Darth Maul where you were going to have uh, him, James, on the screen moving his lips, but they were going to ADR hmm. uh, Patrick Stewart's voice in his lips to show an age thing. Wow. It's like, that's complete BS. We always knew it was BS. 
but it would be kind of cool at yeah. the same time to maybe modulate that a little bit. Anyway, folks, listen, we've reached out part of the show for a mailbag. Here's how this works. In front of her, Ashley's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. No, wait, that's buy and sell. <laughs> We're going to take your mailbag questions. Screw it. Let's just get right to it. Okay. Ashley, what's in the mailbag? Jay <laughs> Cleveland wrote, hey, AMC, love the show. My question is, what <laughs> sport movie scenes always make you emotional? Mine is the final round in Warrior. Oh, well, yeah, the, that final round. That Warrior, first of all, is just a drastically underappreciated, underrated film. It's it's beautifully put together, incredible performances, nicely told story, and yeah, it's got the feels at the end at the same time. But And it's got feels at the end that you can kind of see coming. It's a little bit predictable, and yet they manage to hit you in the feels anyway mm -hmm. when it happens, even though you knew it was going to come. It, that's a really a good accomplishment when you can pull something like that off. I've talked ad nauseum about the end of Best of the Best, the one movie that gives you a license to have dude tears in a movie. Uh, so there's that. And um, going back to another movie I talked about before, the the ending of Mystery Alaska. I, I really like that last scene. I think that's a, a really powerful thing. So yeah, those are the ones that stand up to me. What about you, Schnapp? Rocky. Oh, yeah. The very first Rocky. That, you know, he's like, Adrian! You know, <laughs> you're like, yeah. So even though he didn't win, he did win. So I mean, that's my favorite sports movie ending you know that's that is such that goes against everything mm -hmm. in the first sports movie the guy wins maybe maybe there's an empire strikes back later with a good where the hero loses but the, rocky is one of the few films there are a few others that have done it, but it is one of the few films that have done that that the big hero at the end loses and i love the way they handled it because it's almost like it's inconsequential. Right. Well, even in the movie, they don't even focus on the fact that they lost. And winner by decision, Apollo Creed, whatever. And then they gloss over it and blah, blah. And I love how they well, did because that. Because to him, he won. Yes. Because he, all he wanted to do was go the distance with Creed and, and fall in love. And so he he did win. Um, yeah. So that's why, the, you, like you said, in the background, you just hear, oh, yeah, he lost by split decision. But So I agree with you. Rocky, the first Rocky, I actually have Rocky two on there for me as well, too, because she's at home. And for every time he just screams out, yo, Adrian, I did it. It gets me every <laughs> single time. But uh, Rudy. When Rudy gets oh, on the field, yeah. man, like, and his dad's there, and and everyone is in the crowd, what he had to go through to get there, and people are screaming his name, and and he's just running out on that field, and you see him in amazement with his hand up in the air. It gets me. I love Rudy. And you know, sticking with the Rocky thing that we just talked about, loss, it was inconsequential. They did revisit that again for Rocky Six, mm -hmm. for Rocky Balboa, right. and 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 the more I think about it, and I really like that movie, but it's like the fight's over. Rocky didn't even stick around in the ring. For the, for the announcement, He's, he did what he wanted to do. He came in at 60 years old, fought the world champion, took him the distance, walked out, and they announced that the other guy won and, and whatever. It didn't matter. He had accomplished it. I'm Actually, I'm getting yeah. excited thinking about it. All right, anyway, what's next? Malik Haywood wrote, Hello, AMC, Harloff voice. <laughs> Hello! I know oftentimes when we as Hello, AMC. AMC. Is that a Harloff voice? I don't, That's yeah. Harloff I don't know who voice. that guy is. Hello, AMC. <laughs> I know oftentimes when we as movie fans see any images or casting info about an anticipated film, we tend to speculate what we feel that character is going to play and how that actor or actress is going to do. My question is, what was the biggest speculation fail you've ever experienced? Mine is Heath Ledger's Joker. I thought It'd be terrible, but oh, was I wrong. Thanks and keep up the great work. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I, we can all probably think of a few of uh, things that we thought were going to be bad and they actually ended up being pretty good. But the biggest one for me goes completely opposite. It's one that I thought was going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. Turned out great. Three words, ladies and gentlemen. Tommy Lee Jones as um, as Two-Face Two oh, in, uh, in that yeah. Batman film. Because when they announced Tommy Lee Jones, sure. man, that's like an Academy-level actor right. coming it's into this. so good. Oh, my God. Jim Carrey's playing Riddler and I actually, at the end of the day, I didn't mind Jim Carrey's Riddler. At any rate, um, but they made the character another Riddler. They, they, they made them the same character yeah. and act the same way. And Tommy Lee, that wasn't, that's not something Tommy Lee Jones is really geared up to he do. He got so jacked in that movie. That movie's such a big, stinking pile of garbage. Batman mm -hmm. Forever. Yeah. Like, try watching it again. Like, I'm not talking about your memories of it. I'm trying to try actually sitting down and watching it right now because I did. But even it, it is like horrible. twice as good as the one that came after it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's better <laughs> yeah, than exactly. Batman and Robin, <laughs> but not by a mu not not by by much. Not by much. It's like, whew. but yeah, for me, it's it's the the big potential. What I was expecting from the casting fail for me was I was expecting great things out of Tom Lee Jones for that one. So that one's mine. Uh, what do you think, Christian? For me, I'm going to go a little a little different here because a guy that I just con consistently because of his behind the camera antics, I was just oh, great. Now he's going to be in a World War II movie. He's going to ruin it. And that's Shia LaBeouf Shia. in Fury. He was the mm. best part of that movie, hands down. His the, When he acts and when he puts his actual 
energy into acting, he's great. I will even say great. And yeah. he was certainly great in Fury because I wanted to hate him. Going, I was like, put the bag back on your head before the movie even started. <laughs> but then it started, and I was just telling myself to shut up because the guy really put in a great performance there. And what's what was the name of that one that smaller indie film Shy did last year? What's the name of the character? Danny Buttersworth. Or, yeah, or something. Was, I was it trying was to remember. It the name of the it. character, and it yes. was awesome. It was a great film. He was film. so good in exactly. that. Exactly. That's the same thing. It was like Shia LaBeouf's in it. I don't know. And then we saw it. It was like, whoa, what yeah. a great film. Unexpected. Um, for me, sticking in the superhero genre, I'll go to Michael Keaton. Everyone was. Uh, Popping oh, yeah. off, Mr. Mom, Beetlejuice, uh -huh. like me ruining my my Batman. The movie comes out, all of a sudden he is Batman. And then they really wanted him back for Batman Returns. He did another great job. So, I mean, you know, like the whole thing with like, could Nicolas Cage been Superman? We'll never know. I thought it was an inspired casting. We're always going to get different characters playing these roles. People love to feel... Uh, like their characters being taken from them if mm -hmm. someone that they don't exactly, it doesn't fit their mold. So that happens all the time. You mentioned Heath Ledger. I mean, for me, I'll say, when I heard Chris Evans was playing Captain America, I still had him as like, oh, the failed human torch. Why mm -hmm. is he playing Captain America? It just didn't, it didn't gel with me when I first heard that casting. And then I saw him as Captain America and I was like, wow, sold 100%. So, I mean, sometimes casting decisions work both ways. You're like, ah, I don't really see it, but you always have to wait until you see the movie to make that final call. I'll go there with Scarlett Johansson too, because Scarlett Johansson, mm. when she was cast as Black Widow, I'm like, come on, they're just getting her to play pretty. I can't see. Emily Blunt probably could have done it also, but it's hard to imagine anyone else except her because she right. really owns the role now. And I remember even when the first Avengers trailer came out and she was kind of back to back with the rest of them, I'm like, that's silly. What's she going to do? And She's got she, her two little guns. Pew, yeah, pew. Yeah, and she sure did. Uh, she, I mean, she's great. She's great. Yeah. And the other one that people always forget about, too, I mean, we, we bring it up because lest we forget, guys, the, the outrage when Hugh Jackman got cast as Wolverine. Totally. Everybody was so pissed, so mad. What, this Aussie Broadway guy? Are you kidding? And now we can't even imagine. And it's even the him. opposite. Like, for Batman, Michael Keaton was, like, a lot shorter. Hugh Jackman, way taller. Right. Wolverine's supposed to be tiny. You know, everyone was so angry about that. It's it like, you should be played by Danzig. It's like, know, right. oh, remember, God, remember right. that? Yeah, yeah everyone right. was serious. saying that. Yeah. People were dead serious. All right, folks, listen, not only do we like to take your questions via email, but we love taking your questions via Twitter as well. So if you've got a question and a Twitter account, just tweet out a question to us and put in the hashtag AMC Movie Talk. That way we can find it. So, Ashley, what is in the Twitter sphere today? Yuhan Houth writes, what are some films that get you excited to introduce to someone who hasn't seen those particular films yet? There are two that I get really excited about. One is The Godfather. I love introducing people to The Godfather because a lot of people have not seen The Godfather, which is crazy to me. Yeah. It And when I love watching it with them and then have them go, every movie ever made since The Godfather is just a copycat of The Godfather. I mean, and it, and it really is, when you watch that movie the first time and you realize this is the movie that innovated so much of the narrative type of things that people like to do in their films now, it's influenced so many directors and it's just so awesome. And then finish watching that one and they say, hey, there's a Godfather 2. And they're like, what? And then you pop in Godfather 2. Is there another one after this? Nope. No, yeah. no, no more. It just ended with Godfather 2. <laughs> it ended with Godfather <laughs> um, But the other one I've talked about on the show before, I get so much joy in my heart. I, I I swear I'm going to set up here in the studio. I'm going to set up here in the studio. we got a viewing room out there. We're going to have a night. We're going to get the whole cast together. And whether we've seen it or not, we're all going to watch Vanilla Ice is Cool as Ice. I love introducing people to this movie. It is so much fun to watch. I swear. I'm not being facetious, folks. Vanilla Ice, Cool as Ice is so much fun I'll to vouch watch. for him because I think I watched it before we even talked about it. That's I was like, right. hey, man. You was know, it like just the, like a few days before? Yeah, it was right before. And I was like, you know, I watched this Vanilla Ice movie and it was like really funny. It was horror. <laughs> it's a horrible movie, but it's... In its horribleness, it's pretty fun. It's the ultimate so bad, it's awesome movie. Yeah, it really it's falls really, into like, that. And a lot of people say it's The Room. It's not The Room. No. It's Vanilla Ice is Cool as Ice. Anyway, what I'll, about you? I'll throw in a so bad it's good. It's Under Siege 2. I, I laughed <laughs> I so that. hard at that movie, crying. Um, for me, it's actually a smaller film. is Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Ooh, oh, yeah, yeah, That's yeah, a yeah. movie that if like when people want to see, oh, Jim Carrey, always oh, trying to do the serious roles. Like, you want to see Jim Carrey at his best? It's that movie. He doesn't. He's not over the top. He he hits levels that you. Going back to what we were saying with Shia LaBeouf, you see how talented Jim Carrey is in there, and what um, just with Kate, the back and forth with Kate Winslet. I I love 
I love that movie so and much. And it's a, so if you're if you've been in different relationships, it's really That's soul it crushing is. too. Yeah, it's but like that, you're that, like the memory is. It's it's that, and it's also kind of therapeutic yes, too. Yes, very. Because therapeutic. I've watched that movie out of a relationship. I've watched that movie in a relationship. There's so many different ways. Just in it's in life thing, it makes you question. Oh, well, would I have done that? That's interesting, and, and it takes you there for sure. The other one is it's funny because it's funny enough how much I'm into Star Wars that my wife is not at all. I mean, at all. And finally, I got her to sit. I had to. I had to pick one movie to try to get her to watch the franchise franchise with, and it wasn't New Hope. I started her with Empire, because I actually tried a long time ago. With, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna try to start with a Phantom Menace just so she blows through these things. Oh. She bailed after Jar Jar stepped in, in poo poo. Right. Right. <laughs> so I said, I'm not making that mistake again. Me so stinky. Yeah, those are what it was Bantha poodoo. And and so by putting her by doing Empire and selling the Han Solo Prince Leia story there, and the, she was getting into it, and I could. She, she was not an ultimate Star Wars fan, but still, that's a great movie. So if someone doesn't want to watch any of the Star Wars movies, and you want to get them into it, and it's got one of the best twists of all time. Well, it's one of the best written Star Wars. That's what films. I mean. So yeah, 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 you sure. know, yeah, total side note, total side note. You just mentioned Kate Winslet in Eternal Sunshine, right? I It was funny because I was just having this conversation with a friend of mine the other day. I honestly think that about 10 years from now, we are going to kick ourselves that in her heyday, which is right now, we did not recognize her as maybe not one of the one, two, or three, but one of the greatest actresses so of all time. Yeah. She has so quietly gone under the radar, and it's like, how many Academy Award nominations do you have now? Like 33? Does she really? If, no, not 30, I but I mean, like, it feels like every year, she's got multiple, it feels like every year her name comes up for Academy Award didn't nominations. She, didn't she win one for the reader? I thought she won. I know she got nominated for the reader. I can't uh, remember if she won or not, but well, it's like, yeah. she's one of those people that's like, you know what, in a few years, we're gonna sit back and we'll actually look at her filmography and go, Holy crap! Like she's six nods already. Six nominations yeah. already. Yeah. Well, I mean, and the sad part about it is she is one of the most underrated, incredible actresses out there, and yet she's in like silly stuff like Insurgent. In right now, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. like what a waste so Jeff of her Daniels, incredible though. talent. Jeff yeah. Daniels is entering it, so yeah. so talent Ooh. talent being wasted. Somebody out there as a producer, hire Kate Winslet immediately. Um, I got the three Bs. I got Blue Velvet, I got Blade Runner, and I got Brazil. So those are the oh, films Brazil. that I like. I like to turn people on to. Um, if they haven't seen any of those, there's a whole bunch of them, but I was just thinking through, you know, definitely another B, which is a, a guilty pleasure, Battle Beyond the Stars. So that's like a fun Seven, space Sam Cowboy. Yeah, seven Samurai <laughs> in Space or Roger Corman classic. Uh, you got Zardoz. I got a lot of like fun, like weirdo films. Anything by Jodorowsky, if you've never seen, you should see. Um, Altered States, perhaps. And also that movie, Altered States. So there's a whole bunch of different films that are really fun to tell people. You haven't seen that, or if you like this, you'd, lo you'd love that, so. All right, what's next? Riley Lyons writes, what's going on with the Universal Monsters Cinematic Universe? Is it still happening? Yeah, as far as I know, it's still moving ahead. I haven't heard anything to the contrary. Um, what's the first? I think the first one is The Mummy. Uh, Redux. They've, they've gone through some director changes. I know they moved the release dates a couple of times. Wasn't Dracula the first Dracula one? Dracula twice baked. Wasn't that yeah, the first one? Well, well no, the first technically one. it wasn't it part. Wasn't really. No, it wasn't supposed to be part of, this, of the oh, uh, overall universe. Was. And then at the last minute, they decided... We should film this one extra scene at the end. It's like a post credit scene. So if we want to tie it into the larger universe, it is. But that first Dracula movie was not meant to be part of the, this new monsters thing. Now, they may have... I have a feeling they, they shot that last scene to say, if we want to tie it in, now we can. I got a feeling they won't okay. after the reception it had. But they may. They still might. But as, as far as I know, everything's still moving ahead. Have you guys heard any different? No. No, but I mean, you know, it's sort of, it is, it, it feels like a cheap, desperate shot from Universal. Like, well, let's jump in on that superhero bandwagon and make the Monster Squad. Well, then just make the Monster Squad. Don't try to tie in all these characters. Look, if they're going to tie it in, at least make it horror based. It's yeah. not a superhero team with the mummy and Dracula all hanging out around a table. How do we fight Mephisto? Or it just sounds right, like, less action adventure. Yeah, it sounds really back, corny yeah. to me. And it's like, I like my horror films like horror films. I don't need a superhero horror team. And we don't do that. They haven't had a shared universe inside of that world would be interesting. But I think it goes back to the conversation we're having with Dracula here is once the first hit happens and they're able to use the time because I, I agree with you, they're going to stay away from Dracula, whatever the post credit scene is, they're going to stay away from it. And then if the next one's a hit and they can tie it in more, right. then you'll probably start hearing a lot more about it. But they need that first hit. Well, first. I tell you, Marvel has just got that just sitting, waiting to be developed. We, we talked about that on the show a couple of maybe heroes a couple episodes ago about Werewolf by Night, Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. They have all the Mephisto. They have Ghost Rider. They have Blade. They have this Mor Mor Morbius. They have all these like 
monsters inside the Marvel Universe where they can easily make it like a cool monster movie that has all of them in so it. So they're a little busy. I was they actually, are busy. I thought it was a great idea for Universal to, to restart that. Look, you got these rich with great historical significance, these all time iconic classic monsters of the big screen. Why are you not doing right, something with right. them? It's it's but it, it's going back to what you said. It's going to all be about how do they execute it? Right. Because if they just do another Brendan Fraser mummy, which hey, the first one worked, and I, I even like the second one. Yeah, but if you're going to try to do that and build a new series, I don't think it'll work. Get have a little bit of fun to it, but also have that horror edge to it. It could be really good. It could be Van Helsing it, though. Yeah, no, but it could but be they, Van Helsing I, I exactly. That's the horror of it. I mean, to me, the horror of it is literally. Don't go action with your horror. With you. Go horror. That's what everybody who loves these films, like me specifically, The Mummy, The Invisible Man, you know, The Creature from the Black Lagoon, stick to the basics. It's a horror film. Then you could tie all the other characters yeah. together in a horror universe. Don't go action. It's the dumbest thing. And I pull back remember. on CGI though too. Same same thing with uh, what's what's the series with Kate Win Kate Beckinsale, the one with uh, Underworld. 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 That series kind of jumped the shark too. I think that they pulled back going in horror direction and scale it. But I think we talked about this like last week with Friday the 13th is go smaller budget with it. You don't go, need a hundred Draculas, you, need you need one yeah, Dracula. You, I mean, that's right. I mean, people forget that very first alien, how many aliens were there? One, and it was frightening. Right. So, I mean, I don't know. But also let's not forget that I think it was Universal. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure it was Universal. It might've been another studio. They tried going horror again. Remember that Anthony Hopkins Wolfman Yes, with, uh, it was horrible. Yeah. With Benicio oh, yeah. Del Toro yeah, 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 barely yeah. in it. Yeah. it, it, it they, so they tried doing it, didn't work. What I don't mind is do a horror film that's got action in it, don't make an action comedy with a few elements of horror to it. Right. It all depends on what's their priority. Right. Right. All right, do we got another one? We do. Chris Dionofrio writes, what are the chances of Marvel developing a Punisher project based solely on Tom Hardy's interest in playing the character? Absolutely dead 100% zero. Now, that's not to say it can't ever happen, but no studio is ever going to go, oh, wait a minute, this actor is interested in playing one of our characters? Mm -hmm. Guess what, folks? There are a hundred A-list, well, there's not even a hundred A-list actors. Every A-list actor is, out there is interested in playing the lead in a Marvel superhero film. That's the age we live in now. Right. It's an automatic, four to f automatic in your sleep, Marvel superhero film, 400 to 500 million dollars worldwide. Huge, you know, boost. You can then do anything you want, all this kind of stuff. Introduce, if you're a serious actor, it'll introduce you to a whole new demographic of audience. Uh, it, it's guaranteed paychecks for the next little while. But I mean, everybody wants to do it. I always, it, it, it fascinates me when people think it's a story when, did you hear this actor's interested in being in this movie? Of course they are. They're actors, it's their job. They want a paying gig that's gonna be huge? Of course they do. Look, no, Marvel is not gonna go, oh, well, since Tom Hardy wants to, right. maybe we should do it. I, no, that that isn't a possibility. What's not a possibility is at some point in the future, they do a Punisher film, and at some point in the future, you know, Tom Hardy gets cast to play it, but they ain't gonna put the wheels in motion just because some actor wants to play the role. Not gonna happen. No, I agree with you. It's not gonna happen with th that scenario, but I think it's possible. I don't, first of all, I don't think Punisher's gonna happen as a film. I think it will be a Netflix series. I think that if there's an, if there's ever a series that should happen on Netflix, it's the Punisher, yes. and I think Daredevil set that up. Um, and I think what will happen is, oh, well, Hardy said that he's interested. We're doing Punisher the series. Let's make an offer. And whether or not it happens, who knows? If he passes, nah, we're not doing the Punisher series. That's not going to happen. So they'll go after whoever's right for the role. I'd like to see Tom Hardy play the Punisher. And maybe because what I, th and he's done Netflix before in Peaky Blinders. And mm -hmm. I think what that sets up is if you get someone like Tom Hardy in a Netflix series, it's easier to cross him over into the ultimate Marvel Cinematic Universe. So I'd be interested to see if that's the direction it ultimately happens. Yep. Yeah, I heard Brad Pitt wants to be Moon Knight. <laughs> I just read that on like, Cosmic Soup News or something. I was like, wow, that's Brad Pitt actually, first of all, read that on the Shep Zone. And I was like, yeah, it was so weird. So anyway, yeah, I don't think, you know, that actors say who they want to play is, is great because that's sort of like, oh, at least Tom Hardy knows who the Punisher is. That's kind of cool. Um, whether or not that means anything to Marvel or, or Netflix or any of these deals that have been, you know, years in development. Hey, maybe some some a producer's like, hey, did you hear about Tom Hardy wanting to play Punisher? Cool, put him on the list of like ten people, you know, when we get to it. So yeah, I don't think that's gonna jumpstart it, but it's probably all the gears are already in motion to do something with the Punisher, just like gears are in motion to do something with Ghost Rider and all these other characters. It's just not they're not gonna announce it because it's years from now. So 
All right, was that it? That was it. Well, folks, that will do it for us for this installment of AMC Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. And don't forget, if you like watching trailers, all the movie trailers are over there on amctheaters.com as well. And also, don't forget, if you're watching us on YouTube right now, click that subscribe button. Become a subscriber to our AMC Movie News YouTube channel. It'll keep you up to date on all the shows that we're doing around here. And if you want an audio-only edition of this episode, so look in the description of this video and you'll find a link to our podcast feed. I want to thank, first of all, the guys sitting at the table with me, sitting over here, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Twitter, Instagram, at John Schnepp and at TDOSLWH. I'm going to be in Atlantic City this weekend at the ACBC, their very first big Comic-Con in Atlantic City, New Jersey. So come on by. I'll have a bunch of posters from The Death of Superman Lives. I'm doing a panel and whatnot. And if you haven't gotten your tickets for the MCM London Comic-Con, go to the MCMLondonComic-Con.com and buy your tickets. We're going to be there May 22nd and 23rd doing a meet and greet and showing the film. Over here, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? Well, obviously on Twitter, uh, at Christian Harloff, as well as Instagram. And if you guys haven't been watching AMC Coming Soon, you should. Because if you want to, everyone's always asking, well, I've never heard of that movie. We preview all of those movies on AMC Coming Soon, as well as AMC Jedi Council. Hashtag AMC Jedi Council. Get your question on the air every Thursday, talking Star Wars. And aren't you guys, you guys are talking Mad Max this week, aren't you? We are. Uh, that's awesome. And um, don't forget, guys, we also have a lovely host over here in the pink chapeau, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And you can simply follow me on Facebook and on Twi Twitter, simply at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks a lot for joining us. My name is John Campia, and for AMC Movie News, and until next time, bye-bye.